Hi, it's Jen from Shabby Fabrics, back with a year in words for September. Hey, if you got into the club, congratulations again. People are still wishing they had joined the club. Hey, there's more clubs coming up, by the way. So if you did, uh, if you are watching, you didn't miss out this time, there are some limited kits available of each of the months. Um, and of course, each month, we're also giving you some support on how to do the piece locks and offering you some possibilities to hopefully increase your accuracy and offer you some options as well. We'll definitely be focusing on the flying geese. I love that the classic block. Um, but let's focus first on the applique portion. You have a larger piece of applique background this time. And that's because of course, you're not only using it here, but it's being used over and over again in each one of those flying geese blocks. So in order to maximize your fabric and make it uh, all the blocks come out and you have plenty of fabric, you'll go ahead and, and once you have your fabric pressed out, you'll cut that seven and a half by width of fabric and you'll take that piece to seven and a half by 25 and a half for your block background and then save that fabric. We're going to be using that uh, to be able to cut our squares for our flying geese block. You'll be needing all of that. Once you have your background cut, of course, you'll be using your layout diagram to and your um, light box to lay that out and put all your shapes in position. Notice there's no applique pressing mat with me this month. There's not really a whole lot of overlapping happening, whereas applique pressing mat is really where it's used for that purpose. So. You really probably don't need that one. Just a little bit of overlapping here with the apples kind of overlap the U and a little bit down here on the end, but nothing you couldn't visually acquire just by laying those pieces down. Of course, once you have them down to the background, you'll have a really fun opportunity to use a lot of colors because this one is so colorful. And by the way, when you're punching all these shapes out, there's a lot of small leaves, which makes it so pretty with these leaves up here and kind of just drifting around in the project. Make sure you don't throw any of your uh, laser cut shapes away until you're absolutely sure you've punched everything out and laid that out. Then, and only then, it's probably a good idea to discard that. But I've done that before when I've been quite sure there couldn't be one more piece in that. And I tossed it in the trash only to find later as I laid my shapes out, I was missing something. So I just wanted to point that out. And by the way, if you're really enjoying the laser cut, I love the accuracy of it. Lots more of uh, laser cut kits on the website. Go to the home page on the left navigation, click kits, and you can look for kits that are by type and choose laser cut applique. So just wanted to mention that as well. Once you have all your applique done and stitched down, we can turn our focus now over to those flying geese blocks. Again, it's a classic block. I'm going to show you the traditional way that I learned and as the instructions that are included in the pattern. And then we'll give you some options if you want to choose those, to maybe upsize those just a bit and use a tool to trim them down for just perfection so that when you are lining those flying geese blocks up, they just line up and sew together so perfectly. But let's go with a traditional approach that probably you and I both learned, or maybe you're just learning for the first time. This is how you make a flying geese block. The main portion or the uh, colorful portion, you're just cutting a two and a half by four and a half inch rectangle, and you'll need two squares on each side that are two and a half by two and a half. On the back side, you'll want to make sure you ID the front and place that face uh, down with the wrong side up. You'll just be using a straight edge, and I like to use my friction pen that erases with heat. And I'm just drawing a line from corner to corner, and you'll be doing the same thing on the second piece. You'll lay that first piece, it doesn't matter whether you start on the left or the right, it will result in the same block. You'll just place that uh, right there on that corner. So your footprint is exactly right over top of that. And we're just going to sew on the drawn line. And let's just move some of this out of the way. Before I trim away, because this portion will be trimmed away, I like to double check. There have been times that I have my pieces shifted. Notice I didn't pin. I was kind of not being very disciplined there. 
now that I think that through, I should have put a pin in there. But I've done that before where I was just in a hurry to get it sewn and it kind of shifted. And when I pressed it to the outside, I could see I was maybe shallow. Maybe it can kind of look like this. That's why I don't trim until I press to the outside, kind of finger press that, and then give it a, a good press with the iron. And once I feel like I have not overshot that or undershot that, and I kind of can check that from the back, then and only then do I lift the flap and trim this away. Every time I use this cute little ruler, it reminds me. It says, I love my quilting friends. You know, if you've got those types of friends that it's nearly impossible to buy something for because they, you know, are just, they have things. This is a great gift for friends. Maybe you're part of a quilt guild, but again, that's a fun little gift idea, super affordable. Same idea. We're going to put the other one on the corner, and yes, it's going to overlap here. That's natural. I will put a pin in this time since I was not very good about that last time. I got lucky, but let's not tempt that. All right, let's go sew on the line again. So let's press that, iron it. I'm going to check that on the back. That looks good. I didn't overshoot that. If you see a lot of white out here like this, it shifted. I would seam rip that and do that again. But I can see that looking from the back, things look really good to me. And I will roll this back. And I like to use this dash line because I lay that right along my diagonal. And I've got a nice seam out there. Now that's how I learned to make a flying geese block. Now the block needs to measure two and a half by four and a half because this is dependent on that measurement. I have nothing to square up now. So just keep that in mind. So that's two and a half by four and a half. One option, you have enough fabric in your kit if you maximize that, you remember I said to cut your, set, your background seven and a half by 25 and a half. And if you maximize the fabric that's left over from that, plus the other fabric that you will naturally have from your three eighths of a yard, you have enough fabric to upsize your flying geese blocks to a three by five and be able to use a flying geese tool by Creative Grid. And I want to show that to you. And you could also upsize that to two and three quarters by four and three quarters if you want. It just gives you the option of making the flying geese a little bit bigger and then using a tool to have it just trimmed so accurately. And I'm going to show you how to use the flying geese uh, tool by Creative Good. This is absolutely one of my favorite uh, tools that I use. And I don't really uh, often make a flying geese block without it because I love the accuracy so much. So I, with this one here, I did the same technique I just showed you. The difference is I cut my red to three by five and my squares out here to three. Now looking at the Creative Grid tool, it gives you actually two, two options. Let's say you took the approach that I just did. You cut your rectangle and your two squares a little bit bigger than they need to be. Like I said, it could just be anything bigger. Over on the left side, and I want to show this to you. Hopefully the overhead can catch this over here. We know that we want our finished blocks to be two by four. Remember I said they're two and a half by four and a half, but that's unfinished. And when they're sewn into our uh, project, they'll be two by four. So two by four means, and we're gonna ignore this chart for now. It means we're using the letter D for trimming. So you see this A, B, C, and D? That's us right here. So let's just go to D. And notice that's trim one. That's telling us we're actually going to trim one time. And then we're going to trim a second time. So this allows me to have this nice line up here. I will trim once. Trim twice. And that's considered, by the way, the first trim. 
But then I'm going to keep rotating this. And I want to show something else to you. You see how it says trim number two right here? So you can see trim number two. And there's my letter D. I'm going to now slide this down to my D. Now look at my dashed lines. Notice how my lines now came into view. We just squared up those two sides. And there's my V. So when I trim this now, now my block isn't approximately two and a half by four and a half. It is two and a half by four and a half. And I love that. So let's look at the two. You can see as accurate as I tried to be, there's just this little bit of wobbliness that's kind of happening along the sides. Just my contact with the fabric left a little bit of fraying here and a little bit of an imperfection here. But I have to live with this because there's nothing to square up. Whereas here, I'm squared and ready to go. And it just having that accuracy, now knowing that the next one will be done and the next one will be done, means that they just kind of stack up and sew together beautifully. So that's how you use the Creative Grid Ruler. But I wanted to show you something else about that ruler. In case you want to use that to make multiple flying geese of the same color. So there's two parts of this tool. Remember how we looked at this and we had this, but then I said just ignore that. Look at this here. To make four flying geese at the same time, now this doesn't involve this project. I'm just showing you one of the highlights of this tool and why I love this tool. I'm bragging about this tool. If you love making flying geese blocks and you want to make four of the same exact color combination, that's when you get to use this other chart over here. So let's pretend you're like, I want to buy that flying geese tool not only to make this, but I want to make other, I want to make other projects. Let me show you how to do it. Let's, let's again pretend we're looking by for two by four inch finished blocks. Well, they say for the colored block, we're going to cut one that's five and three quarters. Just one, just one of these is going to make four flying gaze blocks. This is incredible. And then of the cream, you would cut four that are three and a quarter. Okay, so I have those cut. And you will simply position those corner to corner, just like so. And I've only got the two so far. This is the coolest. I think this is just one of the most amazing inventions, this tool. And you'll simply draw corner to corner, and you'll sew on either side of that. Now I've done that ahead of time. I wanted to save us some time. So I've just sewn on the um, either side of that. And once that's done, I'll just move that for just a moment here. We will cut that apart. And we will press this direction. And I know this looks weird, but watch what's going to happen. And I'll try to move through this quickly because I know it's not really part of this particular project. And the reason it's not part of this particular project, this approach to make four, is we're only making one of each color. And then we change, then we change. But I know when you buy a tool, you want to know what else can I do with this thing? And that's what I'm showing you right now. Now with another one of our squares, And I can see I missed that corner. I'm going to redraw that. That's what I love about a friction pen. If I miss a line, if I misdraw it, I iron it away and start again. Corner to corner. You could also be using the 9-inch seam guide. Creative Grid makes that. What's cool about that is now, instead of you having to find a quarter inch on either side, it draws the lines and you sew on the line. But that's OK. We're going to go with this approach. I'll pin here and pin here, and I'm going to sew on either side of that a quarter of an inch. Okay. 
So we once again cut this apart. I press to the outside. This is probably looking a little familiar to you, right? Now we have a block that is oversized and we will once again have the ability to use our two-step trim one, trim two process. And there's your two flying geese blocks. But remember we had this half two where once again we press to the outside. And for our final square we had four. That's where we place that on, so on either side, and you end up with two more fine geese. Isn't that amazing? It, I love, I love how little fabric it actually takes to make four flying geese, um, and then I get the ability to square up as well. So just like before, we would bring this in here. We're saying, okay, we're two by four. That's line D, and again, we do trim one. We trim up our two sides, and then we go ahead and trim up um, using the trimmed. Uh, trim tool to the second step. So isn't that cool? I love that. I'm always excited to brag about this amazing tool. <laughs> okay, so you have your flying geese blocks done, whether you've done the traditional way or you went ahead and squared those up or oversized those and squared those up with the trim tool. You'll, of course, sew those all together, measure what that is, and then you'll uh, go ahead and trim your background to be that exact size. Sew those together. And of course, press toward your applique. You'll want to put your batting and your backing quilt cool as you desire and bind. But if you would like to go ahead and add some of the hand embroidery detail to the leaves, I'm just going to show you that right now. Just know that the hand embroidery is always an option. If you don't want to do that, simply skip that. I'd love to encourage you to actually do that hand embroidery before you do your quilting. And that way, this isn't going through all the way to your backing. So let's just pretend that you did opt to have the embroidery. All that is is a back stitch. So I just want to show you that real quick. So I'm just going to draw a line here. I have the Richard Hemming hand embroidery needles. These are great. One pack is going to last you a long years. Just a couple dollars. This is the size four. I have two strands of my total six strands that are included in my hand embroidery uh, floss that's inside the kit knotted that at the end. We'll do a um, come up here. Better get my glasses on. Increase my chances of success. This is called a back stitch. We will come down a short distance. The biggest mistake you could probably make in back stitch or really in any stitching is taking too long of a stitch. So that's a nice short stitch, maybe an eighth of an inch, maybe a little bit longer. And then I'll come down at the same distance that I traveled, and then I'll move back toward myself. Hopefully the overhead camera can pick that up. We'll zoom in just a touch. We don't want to be out here. You can see that distance is greater than where I've been, what I've been doing. So I want to keep a nice, uh, consistent length. We're coming up and moving back toward ourselves. And that's why we call this a back stitch. It's one of the most basic stitches in hand embroidery. And I'll do it one more time. And then we can just tie off in the back. And again, you know, that's the hand embroidery detail is an option. And you could also, you know, if you're very comfortable uh, with your sewing machine, stitch that on by machine. So that's another option for you as well. Just to tie off, I like to just go underneath the stitches where I just uh, put in at least twice. Just like that. And then I just leave a little bit of a tail, not too big. And then I just trim that away. So pretty fun to do, add that little detail. And, but again, if you're comfortable doing that by machine, by all means. <laughs> I have better control, I think, with the hand embroidery. So I hope you enjoyed learning some options for making the flying geese block. It's one of those classics. And I think this tool is worth its weight in gold, if that's an option for you. 
I hope you're enjoying uh, the tutorials for the Year in Words series. I'll see you soon for a Year in Words for October. See you soon.